Let us remain standing as we hear God's Word read for us. We first come to our Old Testament reading in the book of Jonah. Jonah chapter 4. Hear now the word of our God. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. So he prayed to the Lord and said, Ah, Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore I fled previously to Tarshish, for I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Then the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city. There he made himself a shelter and sat under it in the shade, till he might see what would become of the city. And the Lord God prepared a plant and made it come up over Jonah, that it might be shade for his head to deliver him from his misery. So Jonah was very grateful for the plant. But as morning dawned the next day, God prepared a worm, and it so damaged the plant that it withered. And it happened when the sun arose that God prepared a vehement east wind, and the sun beat on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. Then he wished death for himself and said, It is better for me to die than to live. Then God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And he said, It is right for me to be angry even to death. But the Lord said, You have had pity on the plant for which you have not labored nor made it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left and much livestock? We turn now to the New Testament to Luke 15, reading verses 1 through 2 and 11 through 32. Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. Jumping down to verse 11. Then he, that is Jesus, said, A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, His father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Now his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, 
And because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time, and yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost and is found. The grass withers and the flower falls, but God's word abides forever. Amen. Amen. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this word. This word that you speak to us through the prophet Jonah and through your servant Luke. May we meditate on these things and know that you alone are the sovereign God who has the right of compassion. Thank you, Father, and open our ears to receive it to ourselves here, what you would have us to hear, that we may live it and observe it. Please be with your servant as he speaks and give him clarity of mind and heart to proclaim the word that you would have all of us to hear. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Dear congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, when we encountered Jonah last week in chapter 3, he had preached a word of judgment against the city of Nineveh. He said, in 40 days, y'all going to die. And in his mind, he thought, okay, judgment is coming for this people. Yay. Because he recalled that those who curse God's people will be cursed. Genesis 12, 3. The Assyrians are our enemies. They've cursed Israel before. God is going to bring judgment on them. The Assyrians deserve to be killed. They deserve to be judged for their sin, and thus Jonah expected fire and brimstone to fall down on Nineveh as it fell on Sodom and Gomorrah. But what do we read in the previous chapter? Nineveh believes the word of judgment. They respond by repenting of their sins, turning away from it, and crying out to God for mercy. And the surprise of all, God himself relents from the disaster he said he would do to them. He did not do it. The Lord showed compassion and by turning away his wrath. And what's Jonah's response to all of this? He throws a pity party. He throws a temper tantrum. This is not what I wanted, God. Why did you do this? The question we have to ask ourselves is, is Jonah's anger justified? Is it good for him to be angry at God for sparing the Ninevites? That's the question that Jonah raises. But as we will see in this passage, the answer is a pretty difficult one for us to hear, but also necessary. That is this. This message of the chapter, as well as the whole book, is that the Lord alone has the right to decide who receives his wrath or his compassion. He alone has that right to send judgment or mercy. And so we will see in this chapter three things. First, we'll see God's compassion challenged by Jonah. Second, we will see God's compassion illustrated by the creatures. And then third, we will see God's compassion vindicated in his word to Jonah. So first, let us consider God's compassion challenged by Jonah. As we saw in chapter 3, God relented from the disaster he said he would do to them, and he did not do it. In In another word, his anger, his wrath against wicked Nineveh subsides because he chooses to show mercy. But someone else's wrath is stirred up. Jonah's wrath. Uh, literally, in the, in the Hebrew, verse 1, Jonah eviled a great evil. 
he was boiling hot in rage and anger against God. One wrath subsides, the other rises. And then in verse 2, Jonah prays. He prays to the Lord. And the topic of this prayer is salvation. In chapter 2, Jonah had prayed this beautiful prayer, giving thanks unto God for saving Jonah from the watery grave of the sea. And it's a wonderful prayer that Jonah says salvation is of the Lord. And he rejoices in that. But now Jonah speaks of God's salvation and speaks against it. Why, O oh God, would you show salvation to those people? What is it that Jonah is praying about? Why would he say this? Well, Jonah himself knew his Bible. He knew from Exodus 32 through 34 that God had shown compassion to Israel when they sinned against God. Recall last week when we saw that when Moses pleaded with the Lord to have mercy on Israel for their sins of worshiping the golden calf, God relented from the disaster and gave the name, the Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, forgiving iniquity and sins. The Lord declared this to be his name to Israel. And Jonah himself is confessing this in verse 2. I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger, abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Jonah knows his Bible. He knows what the Scripture says. But he's not happy about it. Because Jonah also knows that in places like Psalm 145, verses 8 and 9, we read the following. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy. The Lord is good to all. And his tender mercies are over all his works. And the psalm goes on to describe God's goodness to animals, to birds, to creatures, and thus to all mankind, Israelites or non-Israelites. God is one who shows compassion and kindness to all his creatures, not just to Israel. But Jonah also remembers the promises that God made to Abraham, that in his seed all the nations would be blessed. And here Jonah is essentially saying, okay, that's, that's okay what you say, God, about showing compassion to the nations, not Assyria not Nineveh. They can't receive your compassion. And because they did, I'm angry. It is good for me to be angry at you, O God, for showing compassion to these Ninevites. They deserve to die, and you're going to save them? That is why I left Tarshish. That is why I fled the opposite direction. That's why I left in the first place, because I don't want you to show mercy to them. Therefore, just kill me. Take my life. It is better for me to die than to live. As he says in verse 3, Jonah would rather die than have his enemies saved from God's wrath. This is the pity party, the temper tantrum that Jonah throws. Is his anger justified? According to the scripture, no. Jonah is behaving like our first parents, Adam and Eve, where it says, he says, it is better for me to die than to live. Literally, it is good for me to die. Adam and Eve also believed it was good to eat of the tree forbidden. What do they have in common? Both Jonah and our first parents chose to define what is good and evil for themselves. They would not submit to what God defined as good and evil. They chose for themselves. It is good for me to die rather than to have the Ninevites spared from destruction. It is better to eat of the tree than not to eat. Because God's keeping something from us. Good to eat, good to die. Who decides? 
me. But we are no different. Even today in our culture, what is promoted so often is a sense of entitlement. In so many ways, people in our culture propagate this message. You have the right to do whatever you want. Go, eat, live to your greatest pleasure, live to your delight, live to the, according to the dreams of your heart, be all you can be. And if people are keeping you from that, then you have the right to be angry at them. You have the right to express that to get what you want. I remember uh, hearing about this in a children's TV show where the main character was encouraging little children that if mommy or daddy is not giving you what you want, stomp your feet three times and say what's on your mind. How does that work for you? Not too well. But what is that, what is that message communicating? That means Say what's on your mind, and it doesn't matter what mom and dad say. You have the right to express yourself, even if it means cursing them, yelling at them, screaming at them. That's what our culture says to our young people. But yet we also fall guilty of doing this ourselves, even as adults. It is so easy when we come home from a hard day's a day at work, you say to your spouse or your kids, I've had this horrible day. Give me a break. Give me peace. I want to rest. Pay attention to me and my needs. And if you don't, there will be consequences. We may not say those things all the time, but how often is it easy to think that because I had a horrible day at work, my wife and kids, my friends need to pay attention to me so I can feel good especially after my boss treated me horribly. That's a sense of entitlement. It's not something that's owed to us, to you or to me. We owe God everything for all the good gifts he gives, a job to work, a wife or a husband to love, children to raise, possessions to use for his glory. Everything we have is a gift from God to be used for him. It belongs to him, not to us. And so when we throw pity parties, as it were, we ourselves are defining good and evil for ourselves. It is better for me to express my anger against my parents because they won't give me what I want. It is better for me to say these, to expect my wife and kids to behave a certain way, or I will mete out what I want. I will do what I can to get what I want. So I ask you this, is your heart today controlled by bitterness, resentment, or other such th thoughts or feelings? And what is your standard? What gives you the right in your mind to justify that action, that thought? If it's not found in the Word of God, it is sin. It is sin against God. God the Creator alone has the right to decide what's right and what's wrong, what's good and what's evil. Jonah did not have that right, and neither do we. This is the challenge that Jonah leveled against God for the compassion he showed. And God could have been right and would have been right to kill Jonah there and there. But God did not. God chose to show his compassion to Jonah himself by illustrating it through a worm, a plant, and a scorching wind. So we turn now to our second point. In verse 4 we read, Then the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? Literally, is it good? For you to be angry. So God throws the question back at Jonah. You say it is better to die than to live. It's good for you to die than to live. Is it good for you, Jonah, to be angry at me? God isn't speaking in hate 
God is speaking in love to Jonah. As a father deals gently with his children in correcting them, disciplining them, God is speaking to Jonah. Are you right? Is it right? Is it good for you to be angry? At the compassion that you yourself receive from me in the belly of the fish, the salvation that I have showed to the Ninevites? Does Jonah say anything? Nope. Verse 5, he just he leaves and says nothing. Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city. There he made for himself a shelter and sat under it in the shade till he might see what would become of the city. Jonah is so angry and pissed at God that he just leaves. He walks out and still expects to see fire and brimstone. He thinks, okay, give it a few times, give, give it some days, give it some time, maybe God will change his mind, maybe he'll give me what I want. So he builds a tent, he waits outside, and just waits, and waits, and waits. The irony about Jonah, my professor pointed this out to me, Jonah's name means dove. But here, the dove is acting like a vulture, waiting for the death of its victim. That's how Jonah is behaving. He expects fire and brimstone, but nada, nothing. And not only that, but the heat of the sun begins to get to Jonah. The sun beats on his head, even through the flimsy tent that he has built of branches and tree trees and leaves. It's not enough to keep the heat away. But God decides to show compassion upon Jonah. And he does so not simply by speaking to Jonah, but by teaching him through his creatures. Verse 6, And the Lord God prepared a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be shade for his head to deliver him from his misery. So Jonah was very grateful for the plant. God, notice this, the, same, the word God prepared, it's the same word used for the fish in chapter 2. God had predestined, foreordained this fish to swallow Jonah to deliver him from the sea. In the same way, God prepared this plant to cover Jonah in its shade. God has the sovereign. He is the ruler over creation. All the creatures are in his hands that without his will, they cannot so much as move, whether it's a big fish or a plant. And here, Jonah is very grateful for this plant. Jonah probably thinks to himself, wow, God must feel sorry for me. And he's done this to appease my anger. After all, Jonah says he is very grateful for the plant. Ah, I can be out of this dry desert heat and be in the shade. Thank you, God. But not really. Thank you for the shade because you owe it to me. I mean, this plant is, is astounding because a plant like this, some speculate that it's either a castor oil plant or a gourd vine. Now that would normally take about six months to grow to the height needed to provide shade but it comes in a day. Wouldn't you be surprised if a big plant with shade came up over you? You'd be like, ah, this is wonderful. And that's what Jonah's thinking. But Jonah thinks to himself, this is what God's compassion should be like for me, giving me what I want. But the lesson's not over yet, Jonah. God not only predestines the plant, he predestines more. Verse 7, but as morning dawned the next day, God prepared a worm, and it so damaged the plant that it withered. Same word, as he prepared the plant to bring relief to Jonah, he prepares the worm to kill the plant, and it withers and dies. Not only that, verse 8, and it happened when the sun arose that God prepared a vehement east wind, and the sun beat on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. And he wished death for himself and said, it is better for me to die than to live. Again, 
God is Lord and master not only of the good things that we receive in life, but even the terrible things. He is Lord and master over all, the sovereign king of the universe. We confess in Heidelberg Catechism 27 that the providence of God is his almighty and everywhere present power, whereby, as it were, by his hand he upholds heaven and earth with all creatures, and so governs them that herbs and grass, rain and drought, fruitful and barren years, meat and drink, health and sickness, riches and poverty, all things come not by chance, but by his fatherly hand. That's what the Lord is teaching Jonah here. He is sovereign over the plant that brings relief and over the worm that destroys the plant and the scorching wind. All is in God's control. God alone has the right to decide who receives wrath or compassion because he's the Lord of all. The creatures simply obey what God commands them. But even then, we might think that, well, God is in control of both the good and the bad. Does that mean he's not trustworthy? Does that mean he's only thinking of my evil? He's only thinking of destroying me or hurting me? That's our temptation. When the difficulties of life come to us, we are tempted to say, God hates me. God is tormenting me. And that is exactly what Jonah thinks. God, you're just tormenting me. Why tease me with this plant and then kill it and then beat me down with this desert wind? It is better for me to die than to live. But what God is teaching Jonah is that God uses both the good times and the bad times to bring us to himself. To teach us not to depend on ourselves, on our own sense of entitlement, and to rely on him, to humble ourselves under his mighty hand that he may exalt us in due time. God uses the providences of our lives to bring us to himself. It's always for our good when we look to him for mercy. That is often a hard pill to swallow, especially when it hits home. <laughs> I recently received word from my dear friend Isaac and Ellie that with everything going on with little Evangeline, they're going to be saying goodbye to her in the next few days. And for me, it's difficult for me to ponder how can I speak words of comfort to them, knowing this truth, that God is sovereign even over our lives. How can I speak comfort to them? And whether I speak it in words at a certain time or convey it by my presence, the Lord knows what is best. But one thing the Lord does teach us is that he is still with us. God doesn't leave Jonah to his devices. He is with him. He teaches him. He guides him and leads him to himself, to the glory of who he is as the God of compassion. So he does for you and me. He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Even though the trial may come, and we may not ourselves be responsible for that trial, it may just so, it may just happen upon us, but even then God is with us. He's with you. And for Jesus' sake, he will never leave you. God is the God of compassion who illustrates his compassion by the things that he sends to us in this life. And now we see in our final point, God's compassion vindicated. In verse 9, God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And he said, It is right for me to be angry, even to death. So God repeats the question, again, speaking in compassion. Is it right to be angry? Is it good for you to be angry about this little beady plant? And Jonah says, of course it is. That shade was a help to me. 
It delivered me from this burning heat and desert sun. Of course it is right for me to be angry about this, even to die for it. Jonah still is insisting on defining for himself what is good and evil. But God speaks the final word. And it's a word that essentially leaves the book of Jonah hanging. (laughs) And what is this word that the Lord says? Verse 10 and 11. But the Lord said, You have had pity on the plant for which you have not labored nor made it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which are more than 120,000 persons, who cannot discern between their right hand and their left, and much livestock? Think about this, Jonah. You are showing pity for a weed, a pop of shade. That's what you're concerned about? Is that more valuable than a city full of people made in my image? people who are valuable to me, who I made to be my creatures to worship and serve me? You think a plant is more valuable than them? Tell me, Jonah, is a weed more valuable than people, 120,000 of them, who don't know, as you know, Jonah, that I am a God gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love? Recall what Jonah said, I know you to be this God. And God is saying, they don't know that. Can't I show compassion to them who don't know it as you do? Not only that, but really, Jonah, is a plant more important than the sheep, the goats, the cows, the dogs, the cats in the city of Nineveh? Should I not show compassion even for those animals? What's the point of this question that God puts to Jonah? It's to say to Jonah, your anger is not justified. You think it is good for you to be angry about this plant. What about the people of Nineveh? What about the animals? I always find that to be the most funny thing about this chapter. And the livestock? and much cattle. Don't you care about the animals, Jonah? But what it does show is that God cares for all his creatures, Jew and Gentile, man and beast. This is the God who has the right to show compassion or wrath. This is the God who is the sovereign Lord and creator. But Jonah's anger is unjustified. His pity for the plant is unjustified because he thinks the plant is more valuable than human beings made in God's image. And that's what God teaches us in this chapter, in this book, is what he says to Moses in Exodus 33, I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Is it not my right? It is the Lord's right. He made us. He sustains us. And by his grace, he redeems us from our sins. He brings compassion. God has the first word and the last word in the book of Jonah. And his word is, I have the right. It is my choice, not yours. And we must reflect on this as well brothers and sisters, that we all deserve death and judgment for our sins of ingratitude, selfish entitlement, and demanding that we want what we want. That's what we deserve, every single one of us, because everything we have is a gift from God, even the various fingers and toes in our body. Those are gifts from God as well then we are to use them for his glory, not ours. But sin says, no, I'm going to define for myself what's right and wrong. And the response is judgment, wrath. That's what we deserve. 
But God in his mercy, who is rich in mercy, chose to redeem, to save, to forgive sinners, both the Ninevites, Jonah, and you and me. This is the wonder of God's compassion. It's also a wonder that the Pharisees failed to see in Luke 15. Recall what we had read earlier. When the tax collectors and the sinners come to Jesus, they are coming because they see in Jesus mercy. They see forgiveness. They confess their sins. They come to Christ. They are drawn to him because Jesus is himself the God of compassion come in the flesh. But the Pharisees are upset. Like Jonah, they say, it is better for the teacher to not have nothing to do with these tax collectors and sinners. He is done wrong. But Jesus, through a series of parables, teaches them and us a very important truth. That God's heart of compassion extends to all sinners, not just Jews, not just the Pharisees, but to all who come to God in repentance, who confess their sins and plead for mercy. Think of the younger, think of the younger son of the father. What does he say to the father? Father, I have sinned against heaven, against God himself, and I've sinned against you. I am not worthy to be called your son. Earlier in Luke, uh, later in Luke's gospel, Jesus will tell uh, the story of the Pharisee and the tax collector praying in the temple. The Pharisee says, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men. I'm not like this tax collector. I give to the poor. I do this. I do that. What does a tax collector say? He does not so much as lift his head up to heaven and says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's what the younger son does in this parable. And the father welcomes him. He embraces him. He receives him with joy and gladness. And what's the elder brother supposed to do? Join in. Celebrate. The son who has abandoned the house, who has left life and has died, is now brought to life. The son who was lost is now found. Rejoice and celebrate with me, my son. And the elder son, like Jonah, is saying, Give me my fatted calf. I want the party with my friends, not with this prodigal, this evil person. The elder son is the Pharisees. They're the ones saying, God, you are not justified in your compassion to those sinners. Jesus says, I am. The Father is. It is right to be merry, for they were dead and are now alive. The same message for us. We must recognize, as the tax collectors and the, fair and the sinners did, that we deserve judgment, and yet God reaches to us in compassion and embraces us. And how does he do this? Through Jesus Christ, the God of compassion who became man to suffer and die for our sins in disgrace. Think about our Lord Jesus Christ with me. He himself endured 40 days of wandering in the desert, beaten by desert winds, and yet he never complained. He was the Son of God, clothed in resplendent glory, worshipped by angels, and yet became man to suffer shame and disgrace. He was mocked and accused by men, by sinners. He endured the scorching wind of 40 days, yet submitted to the Father's will. He was struck by reeds, but did not vent his anger. His head was pressed by a crown of thorns. And yet he never said to God, it is better for me to die than to live. What did he say? Not my will, but your will. Be done. He did not complain against God for the oppression that he suffered at the hands of his enemies. But when he hung on the cross, Jesus cried out, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. 
Think about what God said to Jonah. These Ninevites don't know from their right hand, from their left. Jesus says of us, you don't know what you're doing. Father, forgive them. Have compassion on them. How does God show compassion to us? Through Jesus Christ. Because he died for our sins. He was buried for us. He rose again from the dead for us. So that we might see and receive the greatest act of compassion that God has ever given to us. The death and resurrection of his son in our place for us, that he might give us life in his name. He has secured our redemption. And as the Apostle Paul says in Romans 5, 8, God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God alone has the right to show compassion or wrath. But the call of the gospel says, look to Jesus and embrace the compassion that he extends and offers to you even now. For there are two choices to make. On the one hand, as his compassion is extended to you as it was to Jonah, as it was to the Pharisees, you could continue and carry on in justifying your anger, saying, I'm going to live as I please. God, I will not be happy unless you give me what I want. If that is what you insist, if this is what you continue to say in your heart to God, then there is nothing but judgment. There is nothing but destruction in the fires of hell. If that's what you insist, then that's what you'll receive. But if you confess your sins and you renounce and forsake selfish entitlements, seeking to define for yourself what's right and wrong and humble yourselves under his mighty hand, if you humble yourself and look to Christ, look to the compassion that he extends to you, then rest assured, this God of compassion will forgive all your sins. He will clothe you in his righteousness. He will renew your heart by your, your spirit so that you may rejoice in God's mercy towards you and toward those you've been hating. God is the one who changes our hearts so that one, we who once hated God and our neighbor is the one who renews us so that we can love God and love even our own enemies. But we cannot show love to enemies unless we first recognize the compassion that God has given to us and rejoice in that compassion. And by his grace, Jesus will enable you to show compassion to others as well, even those who hate and revile you, because you've received his compassion. It is the Lord's right to show compassion or wrath, but thanks be to God that he has shown compassion through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.